So if you have your Bible there, you could turn to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. It was the end of 1998, and the church that we were part of at the time was processing some really exciting ideas. We were thinking of selling our church property and going and buying a couple of blocks of ground and building something new. We'd had some developers in 90, mid-90s show some interest in the, the um, church property. It was very dilapidated. It was needing something. And uh, so we were really excited about the thought of maybe buying land or buying a property and renovating it and having a fresh start. I had just moved from associate pastor to senior pastor, and we had all these opportunities. And I was just chomping at the bit. I was so excited. And and an older uh, chap in our church, part of the leadership, his name was Ron. He'd been um, chair of the Building Code of Australia for years and been involved in development in a big building company. He was in his 80s, a wise guy, still working in the field. And he came up to me and he said... I remember so clearly he said, simmer down, simmer down, young Jono. If we get to sell and move, it's going to be four years before we're in a new church. Well, it was probably just a little over four years later that we got to be in this huge factory that uh, we were able to renovate and we had 6,000 square metres under cover, and uh, it was four years on when we had our celebration service, and I thought, you know, it, that was wisdom. So often in life, when we do what we believe God has called us to do, we act in obedience. We're faith-filled. We step out. We have this expectation of immediacy. We have an expectation that God has spoken, we have responded, and therefore, he's a promise keeper after all, therefore, we will see the storm stilled. We will see an effect to the cause. We obey, we get blessed. Well, I think many of us have learned over our lives that that doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen like that. The timing is the issue. Last week, uh, we began studying the book of Haggai. The first chapter, we saw that Israel has been cursed by God. An interesting phrase, cursed by God. It was because they were looking after themselves and neglecting God's house. So God says to the people of Israel, in this context of their history, you need to repent And change your priorities quick smart. And you need to start looking after my temple. Immediately, the people do what they need to do. They go up the mountain, they start chopping down wood, and they start hauling it down. And they are planning, they're drawing up sketches, and they start digging holes. In Haggai chapter 2, they've been working for a little while now to really get onto finishing off the temple, but things aren't any better. I wonder, I wonder if many of us in this room can relate to the experience of, and you think about what context it is for you. Maybe it was in your marriage and you thought, okay, things aren't going the way that I hoped they would. I feel convicted, challenged by God to act in a certain way, and you do that. But the fruit is a long time coming. Or you put whatever the context is, maybe it's something to do with your integrity, and and you obeyed and waited and... You're still waiting. You you were challenged by God to forgive others and you did your best to do that, but it actually hasn't seemed to bear fruit yet. Today, the book of Haggai is going to raise the question for us, is God good for his promises? Is he? Can, Can he be relied upon even if he is slower to fulfill his promise than we Expect. In fact, I think a lot of the Christian life is trying to deal with that question. 
Is God good for his promises? Is he who he says he is? Can we trust him? Because out of that bedrock foundation of trust comes faith, and you can't please God without faith. So it's a very important question that we think about today. I wonder if many of us could relate to the fact that we want something more concrete than a promise. We want something more concrete than a promise. But what is more concrete than a promise from God? What could be more concrete than a promise from God? But it's where we find ourselves, and faith is not always easy. Seldom is it easy. So here we have these people, the Israelites, in the book of Haggai, who have made the right decision, they've responded to God's challenge, but they haven't yet received <coughs> excuse me, um, any blessing. Let's read Haggai chapter 2, 1 to 3. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? And he's referring to the temple. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So, if you were to look back in the Bible, hopefully it's in your hands, um, or on your tablet or phone, you'd see in chapter 1 that they start working in response to God's challenge at the end of the previous month. So I think it's the 21st of the previous month. Now it says it's the the 21st day of the next month. So it's four weeks. It's actually a time frame that's real. This is a, a real part of history. God challenged them to get up the mountain, get some wood, start building his temple after they'd come back from Babylon. And they're four weeks in... And they're getting tired. Four weeks into the the process of obedience, of response to God's challenge. And we're told it's tabernacles, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of the Tabernacles is, is a really interesting thing for us to understand. Tabernacles is tents, so it's a feast that celebrates when God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt and they had their time living in tents in the wilderness. So it's a time, Feast of Tabernacles, where the people of Israel say, you know what, you can trust God, you can bank his promises. Remember back in our history when he promised he'd redeem us, he heard our cry and he led us out, the people uh, from the Egyptians, um, through the Red Sea and through the Promised Land. We remember when we lived in tents, when we were refugees, We had no home, but he was with us. But it's more than that. The Feast of Tabernacles is the celebration the Jewish people did on the last day of the harvest. So when they would plant their crops and God would send the rain and he's already given them the land and they they harvest the crops. And just when they're filling up the barns with the last part of their crops, they say, let's have a celebration. And it's called the Celebration, the Feast of Tabernacles. This time around, they're meant to be celebrating God's abundant provision in sending the rains, in sending the land, giving the land, and causing the crops to grow. This time, there's no harvest. It's an odd thing to celebrate, isn't it? If you don't have a harvest to celebrate. That's what we are being told in Haggai. It's four weeks into the process of responding to God's conviction. They're starting to rebuild the temple, but it's Feast of Tabernacles. And though they remember God delivers, right now the plausibility seems quite low because there's nothing. They've been cursed. Rather than a time of rejoicing, it is a time of lamenting. It's a time of depression. Verse 3 says this, Who remembers the house in its former glory? He's talking about the temple. The prophet is saying, do you, do, you, do you older people remember when this was Solomon's temple, before it got destroyed by the Babylonians? Do you remember how glorious it is? And they are remembering. And they're shaking their heads. They're thinking, oh, 
The Persians, they've let us come back, but gee, they did a good job of destroying our temple. Gee, they did a good job of destroying our city. We, we have low morale here as we look at it. In fact, it's, it's interesting. In the book of Ezra, chapter 3, Ezra, two years into their return, the people of Israel have come back from Babylon. They've come back and they started building the, the foundation. And it says in Ezra 3, they got to the point of finishing the foundation of the new temple. And it says the young people, like if they were soccer fans, they would have put their shirts over their heads and run around like this, you know, just screaming, yes, we just finished the foundation of the temple. And it says in Ezra chapter 3, at the same time that the screaming and celebration of the young people was just echoing out, there were a bunch of old people who were weeping just as loudly. And it says you couldn't tell the difference. Screaming and cheering, we finished the foundation. At the same time, the old people are going, we're gutted because that is so pathetic, it's not funny. That foundation compared to what it used to be. A lot of people in church in Sydney must live with this all the time, don't they? You think back to the glory days of your church. Oh, the way it used to be when we had 300 in the Sunday school. They filled the car, every car park in the car park was filled with kids. Because there's no OHS issues. And uh, I think it's true. There's a lot of grief that just comes up and hijacks people in their praise. Think, yeah, I remember when we used to be singing the hymns and the house. church would be full. Well, that's what they're feeling. The older people are shaking their heads and wondering, God. It seems like the best years are behind us. It, right now in Haggai, it's been 15 years since the tears were shed and the cheers were yelled. 15 years on. They have a foundation that's not that great. And they stopped. And Haggai had come back and he said, what are you doing? Why have you stopped? And they're like, well, we're all depressed. It's not very good. And we're, we're getting hassled by people. And so they sort of gave up. So... They've been at it for four weeks. It's harvest time. There's nothing to eat. The older people are saying, this looks terrible. And everyone's sort of shaking their heads. And so God gives them a pep talk through Haggai. And this is the pep talk. Now, right, this is a pep talk. Verse 4. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work. And this is like the kicker. For I am with you, declares the Lord. And you might say, that's it. I thought you were giving us a pep talk. I thought you were going to give us some lavish promises, something really good, like maybe just give us a sweetener. Give us a sweetener. He says, it's okay. And here it is. I'll be with you. That's what it says in verse 5. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So God is saying to them, here's the sweetener. Remember I promised you? If you do what I command, you'll know I'm with you. Which is a theme throughout the Bible, isn't it? John 15. Abide in him and he'll abide in us and we'll bear much fruit. The Great Commission. How are we going to teach people how to live the way Jesus said we could live? How are we going to go to all the world? Jesus says, I'll be with you. So God's promise to us, his sweetener is this. I'm your reward. God is the reward. And the question is, is that enough? I have burned in my memory this deacons meeting I was at years ago and we were talking about eternal punishment because it was an issue that had come up in our church and a deacon said something and that sort of struck me he said if people don't burn in hell forever why am I following what the Bible says if they're not going to burn in hell forever why do I have to miss out on all the good stuff and I said whoa that's an interesting commentary, mate, on what the good life is. Are you saying that the good life is to live a low-base morality 
that is counter to the Bible, and there, through that you would get the good life. Are you possibly saying that the only reason you're living the way Jesus said you should live is to avoid hell? Well, it's an odd way to live, because in heaven, in the new earth, well, there's no problem of you going to hell. You're just stuck with God and his new creation and his people. It's quite an impacting thought. Why am I in this? Why am I pursuing God? Why am I following Jesus? Why am I a Christian? Is it just so that I can avoid the consequences of punishment? Or is there a life in the kingdom that I want? Because the way God says for me to live, that's the good life. God promises himself So what does this look like if, and and I'm not suggesting at all that people won't suffer eternal consequences. I'm just saying it was an interesting thought. I hope you, you, you understand what I'm saying. God is the reward of faith himself. So apply that to some real life circumstances. Um, Marriage. If I fear God and obey him, will my marriage be spared and fixed if I have issues? Godly wife does the thing that they're meant to do, or husband. Will my husband come back? Will my wife come back? And the answer is, we don't know, but God promises that he'll be with you. Maybe regarding money. You're challenged to give money away, be generous. Does that mean that God owes you a favour and he's going to just make sure that you have financial blessing? No, I don't believe the Bible says that, but it does promise that he'll be with you in your finances. And so we trade up, which is best, winning lotto or having God? Hopefully it's it's an easy, an easy thought. I want God. You're running a business and you wonder, is it worth me acting with integrity? If I act with integrity, no one else is, but if I act with integrity and I prioritise God's agenda, his kingdom living example, is he going to bless your business? I think he probably will, but the promise is he'll be with you. He'll be with you and you'll know that he's pleased with you. And does that matter? Is that enough? Is that enough? We go through a lot of things. Kids. Will I be able to have kids? Will maybe my kids be able to have kids so that I can have grandkids? I don't know what that answer is, but as we honour God, he'll be with us. A lot of us are dealing with issues with health. If you you do the right thing, say the right thing, pray the right thing, go to the right church service with the right healing gift up the front, are we going to get healed? We have no way of knowing that. But if you honour God, what's the answer? He will be with you. He will be with us. So let me ask you, why are you here at church? Are you here to do some transaction for your well-being? To maybe tick off something that you think God needs you to do? Or is God a means... Is he the end in himself, not a means to an end, if that makes sense? Is God something you go through to get what you're really after? Or is God the end goal? God says to us, trust my promises and I promise you, it will go well for you eternally. In verse 6, God says, Not only am I going to give you my presence, he does give a sweetener, I think. He just gives a little bit more insight. He says, I'm going to do something like you've never seen before. You know, I promised you I'd give you myself, but like, let me just give you an insight into something else I'm going to do. And this is what the prophet says in verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, remember that word, in a little while. I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake, shake the nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. 
the standing at the temple, the foundation of the temple. This is a prophecy about the standing at the temple foundation. I will fill this house with glory. I'm speaking this out, Haggai, as a prophet on behalf of God to a people who are depressed, lamenting. What hope do we have? And he says, let me give you something from God. God is going to shake the nations and fill this house with his glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, God's saying. I am utterly sovereign. You may think the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, they all have power. They have nothing unless I give them something to use. I own it all, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. So he has a couple more promises to give the people of Israel. When does this prophecy come true? Prophecy comes true in part 500 years later. 500 years later, Herod builds a bigger, physically more grandiose Temple. Today, if you go to the Western Wall in Israel and you go deep down there, I know some of us have, you see the big rocks, the tour guide tells you about the rocks. It says, we don't actually know how they possibly move these rocks that are so big. It's beyond us with, without the technology that we have today. Herod did a fantastic job of actually improving that particular temple. It took 500 years before it happened. What if God said to you, I really want you to invest in my kingdom. Oh, thanks, Lord. I would love to be part of it. When's the payoff? He says, 500 years later. 500 years later. We want to see stuff in our lifetime, don't we? We want immediacy. When he said, I'm going to make the next house more glorious than the former, he certainly wasn't just talking about bricks and mortar, was he? He's talking about the desire of the nation. Who is that? Messiah, Jesus. The nations, whether they know it or not, are crying out for a saviour. Hosanna, save us, is the cry of the nations. God, we need a saviour. They just don't know it's Jesus. But he comes. God had promised that there would be a deliverer. Malachi 3.1 says, I will send my messenger. Suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come, says the Lord Almighty. It's the last book of the Old Testament. So 500 years later, Herod did a big rebuild, reno, on the temple. It looks amazing. Matthew 21, Matthew, uh, Messiah comes to that temple and he drives out the money changers and he says, no, no, this isn't what he was talking about. And he judges the religious leaders. And what does he do? He starts healing people in the temple and prophesies about his death. And a week later, he's dying on a cross to make peace with God for all who would come through him to the Father. Can you see the prophecy being fulfilled? Matthew 24, Jesus is saying, Peace will come, but this temple will be destroyed. I'm building something way beyond what you could ever imagine. Revelation 21 is the ultimate fulfilment of what Jesus said would happen, what Haggai said would happen. Not until Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Now the dwelling of God is with men. Old things pass away. He's made all things New. Can you see what happened? Haggai came to a lamenting, disappointed, depressed people and said, God is going to honour your obedience, but hang in there. Even though he says it's going to happen straight away, well, we know in history that prophecy wasn't fulfilled for 500 years. But the Master came, the Messiah came, stood in that temple and said, I am now doing a work. I will die on a cross and rise again. And then I will return and wrap everything up at some point in the future. I've shown you here, 500 year promise, true. Trust me for the next millennia. I'm coming back. I'm going to wrap this whole world up. And you want to be in the ark. You want to be in and covered by my blood. You want to be part of God's church. You want to be part of the peace that I am bringing. Jesus cleanses, he offers salvation. He offers the promise of a future with no sickness, no cancer, no pain, 
no death. But it's in the future. So the kingdom of God is always about receiving promises, receiving actual a transaction, new life, something changes. But there's always more, the promise that we have to wait for into the future. So my question to you is, have you got a hold of the fact that our God is a promise-keeping God? And what he has promised you and I, we can bank it. We can bank it. There is nothing more sure in this world than the promises of God. Can you say amen to that? Easy to say four letters, amen. Harder to live it, but that's our challenge. Is God good for his word? Adam didn't think he was the first Adam. Immediately said, I don't trust your word. I think that snake is telling me more trustworthy words than you. Jesus said, no, man doesn't live on bread alone. I trust your words. And that's our challenge today in the 21st century. Is God good for his promises? He was to the people of Israel. He gave them a better temple. He gave them a way through Christ to the ultimate new temple, which is the Holy Spirit in us. We are the temple of the living God. I started off by talking about the church we were at, Caring Bar Baptist. We finished up on the 31st of August last year. And I had this really sweet time with the Lord because when we, we got this huge factory. It was just people used to mock us because they'd go, What are you going to do? Put seats all the way down there. Well, we did. We had 700 seats in the big auditorium at a Christmas service. And praise God, praise God. And I looked back after 19 years in this church that in the 90s was 70 people with about 20 in the night service and about five kids. And I sat there in the dark on the last Sunday night service and I realised, because I know me, I, I was a pastor there, but I, I know me in the mirror. I go, this wasn't because of you, mate. This is the, the faithfulness of God. And I was there and I just, I just sat there and I remembered praying up and down there when we moved into that factory and it was this old factory that we still had to renovate. We'd have about you know, 100 people in the church and I was thinking, Lord, would you do something special here? Would you breathe again on a church that's always reliving the glory days of the past in the 60s and 70s? A church that people said, these are pastor killers. This church has no hope. They're a bunch of misfits and no-gooders and, and, and haters of people. God, it's your grace. Would you do a work here? And I sat there the end of last year by myself in a dark a church remembering the services and the dozens and hundreds of people that have been saved and the fact that we were caring for 900 plus people in that church. God's faithfulness to his promises. I sat there and I went, God, i got to remember this to, in my family. You're good for your promises. I don't care what happens in church and stuff, calling, career, just for us, for Leanne and I. I sat there and I thought, Gotta remember this, God. You're good for your promises. You are good for your promises. Does God want to do something special here at Hornsby? I think He does, but does that mean something that we fashion and oh, it's going to look like this and sort of some sort of growth and whatever? Who knows what it looks like? It doesn't matter if we stay small. We might plant little churches and never grow bigger than 100 in one gathering, but we plant other churches. But one thing's for sure, if we would repent of our sin and own the junk that's in our lives, lift up Jesus and be a generous church, kingdom-minded, and just let the Spirit go, speak to us. None of us are above confessing our sin and just loving one another and just allowing you to Take us where you want us to be. We will see fruit here. Amen? We will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We will see goodness flowing through the generations. These kids, we prayed that we would have a pram jam at our church. Because we had no prams. We had no little kids. We had about four or five kids in our church. I remember a, a lady by the name of Lynn came up to me about 12 years later and she said, how cool is it to have a pram jam? Remember we prayed for this? She said, there were too many prams. It was an oh and issue. There were dozens of prams we had to deal with. What are all these kids? What do we do with them? Isn't that our prayer for this church? 
that once again we would, we would not tell the stories of the 70s. We would tell the stories of the future. Amen? And we would not forget the glory of the past days because they're, they're God's stuff that he did in 110 plus years at this church. It's God's glory we want to remember. So we back our way into the future. That's what the Africans say. You back into the future, looking back at the past, saying God is faithful. He's good for his promises. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. I want to pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are Alpha and Omega. No one else has that title other than God the Father and God the Son. Alpha and Omega. Beginning and the end. Creator of all that is and all that will be. Sustainer of everything. Would you forgive us, Lord? We are so human and our sight is so impaired and our flesh is so loud and we struggle so much to be who you've called us to be but in recognising that and being a bit depressed about how far we fall beneath the mark in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our business relationships... Thank you for the cross. Thank you for grace that is immense. Thank you that we've never come before you once on our own merit, but every single time is in the merit of your Son. And as a church, we come to you on the potential brink of something special, of something new, of some restart, and we commit it to you, Lord God. We pray that your fingerprints would be all over the future of this church. Help us to grow and own that which we need to, to become more like Jesus as a church. Help us to hold on to your promises tightly. And I pray for individuals here that are just so desperate for you to come come good on your promises. Would you fill them up? I know your word... Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. I pray that you would guide them to the right scriptures to build their faith that they can keep walking, keep serving, keep loving, keep obeying. Because we know you're worthy and you're trustworthy and you're good for your promises. Amen.